In today's world of heavy messaging, AI, and content overwhelm, there is one skill that allows writers to break through the clutter, rise to the top, secure better, longer-lasting clients, and make more money as a result. Listen in and discover why this is the most powerful skill any writer can have today. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, the number one writing superpower and how to tap into it today. I'm Rebecca Batter, your host for today's awesome session. And with me is none other than the guys legendary copy chief, Sandy Franks. Hi, Sandy. Hello, I love that. Now, I'm gonna formally introduce you in just a second, but first I just wanted to let everybody know today that we are very excited about this session. It's something that Sandy brought to us quite a few months ago but something that I've been on her for quite a few years now because she is so gifted at this technique. It's one of the things that drew me to her. One of the things that brought her, that made me attack her to bring her into ADBI <laughs> because we wanted to get better at this. And so I'm excited that it's something we don't talk about very often and that we're going to be giving this to you today so that you can understand the power behind it. By the time today is done, the goal here is for you to know exactly what the superpower is. I love a little bit of mystery and intrigue, but you'll know why it's powerful and how you can start using it in your copy immediately to boost results by, this is what amazes me, 30%. 30%. I should mention that this isn't like another just technique. It's something that you probably are aware of. You just don't understand the power or how to do it the way we want to talk about it today, but it is a foundational skill really that can transform your writing career and the quality of your client relationships. You don't have to be a gifted A-level copywriter to do this, even though Sandy is and has trained some of the best A-level copywriters today, but that's the best part. To get this benefit in your writing, you don't have to be that level of a writer just yet. It is something that anyone can do. And I hate to say anyone, but it is because you don't have to have decade of copying experience to really grasp this like you do with some of the, the higher level or different, not even higher level, different techniques that are out there that take a lot of experience. You actually don't need prior writing experience. You don't have to have, and we've been talking a lot about talent here lately. You don't need this crazy writing talent to use it. You just need to pay attention to what Sandy's covering today and get the questions that you have answered at the end. This technique that we're about to share that Sandy's about to share, I feel like I said, is perhaps one of the most powerful techniques for all writers, bar none. It has the power to be a, I love the word game changer, but I'm sorry, it has the power to be a game changer for your writing career. And what's cool about it is that once you learn it, it could be the differentiating factor between clients wanting to hire you over somebody else. So think about that for a second. Imagine tapping into this writing technique or superpower as we're calling it and feeling that confidence, the, the confidence that your copy or whatever you're writing content will produce up to 30% better results for your clients. I mean, that's to be able to go into a company even and upgrade their copy, the copy that they're using and getting 30% better results than what it was getting before. Think about what that would mean for you. That's 30% more sales, more leads, more clicks, more engagement. Like that's a really big deal. So think about it not only from your client's perspective, but from your confidence perspective. Like what would that feel like for you to know that you had that power, right? And just think about, like I always love the idea of, you know, referrals and networking. Think about what future clients could be saying about you. Like, hey, did you hear about John who wrote that XYZ promo? It beat the control by almost 30% or wow, I saw that social media post that Sandy wrote that went viral. Who wrote that? Those are the kinds of things that can, if you know how to do this properly, that can happen for you. And Sandy's actually going to cover a couple of examples of things that have happened like that. It's like clients will be coming to you, banging down your door. It's such a big deal to be able to improve anything by 30% is crazy. So with that, let me formally introduce my special guest, Sandy Frank. Sandy, I'm so excited to have you here today. If for some reason people don't know who you are, Sandy is a direct response industry legend with 35 years in the trenches, experience working with writers and growing divisions for some of the biggest direct response companies in the world. If you have never had the chance to learn from Sandy, you're truly missing out on a life altering opportunity. I, again, chased her down. She's one of my favorite teachers in the world. 
especially I would, I mean, I worked with Sandy on numerous trainings. I have been in this industry over 20 years and have never sat through anything with her where I wasn't at least one time, like, oh my gosh, I can totally (laughs) take that away. I see it a different way. She articulates things differently. She makes them come to life differently. You're just a a very, sorry. She's a very gifted teacher. (laughs) Like I'm, I'm sending my love letter to you right here, but back to your actual bio. Not only was she on the team of marketers responsible for creating entire campaigns that helped catapult information publishing giant Agora from 35 million in annual revenue to upwards of $1 billion, but she's taken dozens of new green writers, and this is the best thing about Sandy, and helped them transform, has helped transform them into some of the most successful A-level writers in our industry today, right? That's amazing. In fact, she's such a good teacher. One of her protégés is now among the most successful copywriters in the financial niche, earning millions of dollars in royalties, writing for some of the biggest direct response companies in the world. She's also a brilliant marketer. Sandy was right there at the forefront when the shift to digital marketing began. Those were the days. And she and colleague, what's that? Those were the days. It was a big, big different time (laughs) those days. Yes. And she and her colleagues at Agora were the pioneers. Sandy, I'm obsessed with you. So I'm excited to have you here. (laughs) (laughs) Learned about this from you today. And I, at this point, feel like I'm going gushing too much. So I'm just going to hand it over to you and allow you to get started. (laughs) Why? Thank you. And thank you for that fabulous introduction and that love letter. It means so much. (laughs) But I am excited to be here and to finally bring this conversation to life and talk about this superpower writing skill. As you said, it can change so many things. It can transform your life, your career and your personal life. It's done it for me. uh, So I know it's powerful. And I think that once you learn this, you just become a better writer all the way around. It just upped your writing skill like nothing else can. So what are we going to talk about today? I want to tell you why we think it's the most powerful writing skill any writer can have. It's a superpower that trumps every other writing trick or technique out there that you can learn. And what if you tap into the superpower, it's just going to open so many doors for you and set you apart from other writers and make clients want to hire you. But let's talk about what it is not. It is not about finding big ideas. Yes, that's important when we write content and sales copy particularly, but that's not what this is. It's not about how do we create an irresistible offer, which is important because people need to know what value it is and what they're purchasing, but we're not talking about that. It's not even knowing how to do a risk reversal in sales copy, which is where you take the risk away from the reader. So they feel like, oh, I have no reason not to buy this product. Again, that's important, but that's not what this is. It's not about writing headlines or any of that. It's completely different than anything we've tackled before. What it does, though, and this is why it's a superpower, it just multiplies sales. When you use it with your clients, it will make a big increase in their sales. And as Rebecca alluded, there are studies showing that it can increase conversions by 30%. 30% is huge for business. So that's a big deal. You can use this superpower writing technique to breathe new life into old copy. Your client's been using the same copy and their sales are going down and they don't know how to fix it, you can come in and you can fix it using this technique. It'll just up the copy. It'll make it come to life again. Response will go up. You can use it for campaigns. It has been responsible for launching businesses from the ground up. That's how powerful it is. It keeps sales from refunding. It keeps, in other words, it keeps people wanting to stay with that company and that brand longer. It retains customers. It also makes customers more loyal because of this one super power writing technique. It does a lot. And and we're saying it does a lot. And it does. And once I start to show you some of the examples, 
you're going to see why we're so excited and keep saying this is like a superpower. We often call it, and well, as we were talking about it, the holy grail of writing. Um, once you learn this, you'll be in massive demand because clients will want you to write their copy and content because few writers actually concentrate on learning this particular technique. Most of people assume they know how to do it, but knowing how to do it in the right way is very important. And when you do it in this particular way, that's when you become in demand. You'll be able to get clients wanting and begging to work with you. This melts away sales resistance instantly and creates what's really important when you're writing to a reader is you as the writer can create the bond. You want them to feel like they trust what you are saying. And you can only do it using this technique. And as I said before, and I, I attest to this 100%, it makes you a better writer all the way around, period. It, you just will, once you learn it, everything that you've written in the past will be like, oh, well, that's not that was so good because you'll see everything will come through a different lens. You'll just write and you'll just, as you master this technique, it gets better and better and better. And you can just instantly see something that's not good and know how to fix it. It really does up your writing game all the way around. It has for me, I can attest to it. It has totally changed my career professionally and my personal life as well. So we're calling this writing superpower, the narrative nexus. And I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. So it's really a crossroads of three things that are critically important to create that empathy and bond with a reader. It's a crossroads of emotion, experience, and expression. And I'll go through and break down this, what this means. But just think about that. You're taking these three very important things, emotion, experience, and expression. And you're going to use these three things to create that bond with your reader so that if you tell them by the time you're done writing a sales copy and you say, hit the buy button, they are going to hit the buy button. Or if you say, go here to get more information, they are going to go there to get more information. They are going to be glued to everything that you have written because you've used these three things. So emotion is the feeling that you want to evoke in your reader. And we, as writers, this is the great thing about this narrative nexus and the superpower of writing is that we want to control what a reader thinks and feels as they're reading what we write. And this allows you to do it. If you can put emotion into your copy and your content, and you can control what that emotion is, that's how you create that bond. That's how you get a person to take the right action. And the feelings could be things that, you know, we're talking about like, you know, anger, fear, hope, greed, sadness, opportunity. There's a whole wide range of emotions. But if you're the writer who can tap into that emotion and get that reader saying, oh my gosh, I feel this way. That's when they're going to follow and read everything that you wrote from the beginning to the end and do what you want them to do. You take control of the situation because you are controlling the emotion you want the reader to feel. And you basically do this by addressing their fears, their goals, their aspirations. And I'll show you an example in just a minute. Experience. This is what makes something relatable to the reader. When you can relate an experience, when you can get the reader to say, oh, I've done that. That feels so familiar. Or, Gosh, I've had that experience. I've been there. You've got them. You've got them hooked because you're automatically creating that bond where they're like, you are like me. And that's what people want to feel like. Somebody gets me. Somebody understands me. And you're doing that in writing. So you're making everything relatable and getting that feeling. You get the reader to see themselves as the person that you're talking about and your copy or content. And the way you do it is by showcasing a real life transformation. We love as humans, we love when we can see a change occurring, when we see that something went from bad to good, we automatically love it and we want to know more about it. So that's the experience when we can show the reader that experience and get them to get, feel like, oh, I have been there. I've done that too. And expression is 
just ensuring that the message that you're conveying is delivered properly. And that is done by what I call trigger words. It's just the words that you use in your copy, in your content, whatever it is you're writing. It's using the right words, the tone of voice, the pace, the rhythm. Just like a song has a beat and a rhythm um, and different notes, so does writing. It has a pace. It has a tone of voice. It has a rhythm. And when you're able to do that in writing, again, that's how you control what the action you want the reader to take. You've pulled them in. You're pulling out an emotion of hope for them. You're showing them experience they can relate to. Some transformation happened. And you're expressing it in the right way. These three things are what make the narrative nexus so powerful. And here's an example of a campaign, a real campaign that used these three things and created tremendous results. So Dove, we all know, is a maker of shampoos, conditioners, and different beauty products. So they came up with this idea of creating this campaign called Real Beauty. Now, here's where the emotion of the campaign comes in. What they wanted to do was to redefine the traditional beauty standards of what people think what makes a woman beautiful. And so what they were trying to evoke in their campaigns is this acceptance and, so, and empowerment. They wanted people, the women to feel like, I can accept the way that I look. I don't have to accept the traditional standards of what people think are beautiful. I'm gonna accept my own and I wanna feel empowered. So in their ads, they featured women of different ages, sizes, shapes, backgrounds. And they also touched in the campaign on the insecurities that women feel because of these traditional beauty norms. And we all have been there as women. We know what that's like when you have to live up to a certain standard and you just don't have it or don't feel it that day. So we all know what that's like. But what if someone were to come around and say, you don't have to do that anymore? They, you don't have to live up to these standards. So that was the emotion that they were creating in their campaigns. The experience was they want it to be shared with women worldwide, not just to a select group, not to a select age group of women. As I said earlier, they were using women of all ages, size, shape, background. So they wanted this to be a shared experience. And what they actually did is they had an FBI trained forensic artist who sat down with the women one at a time and said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do a, do a sketch of based on what you think you look like and then a sketch of what I think you look like. Just so the woman could see the difference. It's really just to show them, hey, this is what you think you look like, but here's really what you look like. And so here's just an example of the sketches that were done just to highlight the gap between self-perception and reality. This is what, hey, I think I look like this when I describe myself. And so the forensic artist does it. But then he creates a picture of her as he would see him. And, and you can just see the perception is so different of reality. But that was the point of the campaign to show that you don't have to follow these beauty standards anymore. You can create your own reality of what you look like and you should be proud of it. And then they were, they just wanted basically to challenge, for women to challenge, to say, I don't have to follow the standards anymore. And that's why they even named it the Real Beauty Campaign. In just two words, it expressed everything they were trying to convey, all those three things, the emotion, the experience, and now the expression in the campaign was all about, you don't have to follow traditional beauty standards anymore. Your, what you think is beauty is what is beauty. That is your reality, which made this a, such a powerful message for them, for somebody to finally come out after all these years and tell women, you don't have to put makeup on every day to look pretty. You can just be whatever you want to be and look however you want to be. Powerful message. Really pulled out the emotion. It tapped into everything that the woman was feeling like, I don't want to have that standard on me anymore. I can be free of it. So it tapped in the right emotion, it expressed it in the right way, and it made it a very relatable experience. So the result of all of that, Dove boosted their sales from 2.5 billion to 4 billion. That is huge. Just because they use the three points of a narrative nexus, emotion, experience, 
and um, expression and boosted sales. That's a crazy amount of money just from this particular campaign. But it shows you the power of being able to put those three things together, those three parts to create that make the narrative nexus and the power that it can do. Now, imagine you doing that with your uh, client, being able to bring these three things together and help them increase their campaigns. So really what we're saying here, if you haven't guessed by now, the narrative nexus is really all about telling an amazingly good story. It's that experience, expression, and emotion that come together and create a story that's engaging, compelling, that your reader can't help but continue to read, something they won't put down. They'll want to read it. And don't take my word for how important <laughs> storytelling is. Listen to some of these things here. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come from Steve Jobs, right? I mean, here's a man who created a whole new revolution in computers and phones. <laughs> and he's telling us the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. Here's another one from... Ben Horowitz, who is a co-founder of an extremely profitable and held in high regard venture capital firm, the most underrated skill in business is knowing how to tell a good story. And this is so true. I see this so often. People, most writers, they don't know how to tell a good story because they're not using that narrative nexus, but they also need something else, which I'll tell you about. And Sir Richard Branson also says, entrepreneurs who cannot tell a good story will never be successful. So here are some high profile people telling you storytelling, storytelling, storytelling is critically important. Storytelling, here's studies, research shows that storytelling consumers trust you more if you tell a story. Survey shows that 81% of consumers say they need to trust a company before making a purchase. Storytelling helps convert leads into customers more often. And we mentioned this earlier, it can increase conversion rates by 30% with a good story. Again, big numbers, not 1%, 2%, 5%, 30%, double digit percentage, big number. It's increasing sales. Um, studies reveal that if people love a brand story, 55% more likely to make the purchase in the future. 44% will share the story and 15% will buy the product immediately. All because they read a really good story. They heard it. They were compelled to take action. And because that story had that mix of those three things, right? That narrative nexus combined together. And 62% of B2B marketers say it's one of the most cost-effective content strategies they use is telling a good story. Here, a Stanford study found that stories are 22 times more memorable than facts alone because, duh, our brain doesn't think in numbers. We think in pictures. That's the way our brains are wired. We don't we don't recall facts unless they're told to us in a particular way or style or story. It's just not the way that our brains work. So stories, we are hardwired for stories, period. I'm going to show you a couple more examples of the story of uh, storytelling and the power of it. Everybody knows this, has seen this, right? It's been called one of the greatest direct mail letters ever written for the Wall Street Journal. It was mailed from 1975 to 2003. It did $2 billion in sales in 28 years. That's $195,694 a day in sales. And if you, you can see, it is just a well-told story. There's no incentives here. It's just a very well-told story, which is why it's such a classic and legendary piece of mail that you see in a lot of 809 courses that we show it to you because it's so powerful. Because look at those numbers to support it. It's a little two-page story, and it did a phenomenal job. Here's another one. You've seen this one before from John Caples when they, they laughed when I sat at the piano. 
But when I started to play again, sold hundreds of a home music study course. Why? Because it's a relatable story. It's a story. That's what's working here. It's a story. It's a mix of emotion, experience, and expression. Another one, this is for Covenant House, the story of the dirty lady. It was mailed for years and years. It helped grow their annual budget to 87 million. That's three times more what the government was spending on homeless children. Again, the power of storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. And let me show you proof of how stories really do work. So Save the Children is a charity, right, that helps with children, and they were struggling to acquire donors. So they decided, well, I'm going to ask the researchers of Carnegie Mellon to see if they can help us figure out some new technique that we might be able to use to increase the amount of donors that we get. So Carnegie Mellon researchers said, fine, we can help you with that. We'll put a little study together and then we'll share the results and that might help you create more campaigns to get more donors. So they created two different brochures and they gave the brochures to different groups of students. And along with the brochure, they gave the student $5. So some students got one brochure, some students got another and they all got $5. Brochure A was an infographic, was basically a listing of stats on things like droughts, food shortages, rising costs, catastrophes, anything that would affect their charity. And it was just a simply straight listing of all of these stats and figures, maybe a chart included. Remember, so they got the brochure with that in their $5. The other group of students got a brochure that told the story of a little girl and how her life would be changed with their help. So one brochure A is stats, <clears throat> one brochure is a story and they each get $5. So they're sort of a, like A-B split testing of this idea. Do, do the facts work or do if we have a story, does that work better? Now, do you wanna guess which brochure you think works best? And um, you should know by now. After everything we've been saying, the answer is that students who received brochure A, which was just the facts, donated an average of $1. It's supposed to be 11 cents from their little $5 cachet. And the students who received brochure A with this story, they donated twice as much money. I'm losing my voice here. <clears throat> they donated twice as much. So the facts, they get some money, but the people who read the story donated more. They donated twice as much money. That goes to sh show you the power of a good story. The story itself is what compelled the students to give more money than just seeing facts alone. And storytelling right now <coughs> is needed more than ever. We get bombarded with messages. And I saw a statistic that said 66% of consumers want fewer marketing messages because we're just getting them regularly. 27% of consumers say they feel bombarded with ads. I do. I'm sure you do too. You see them all the time. You're, there are just countless promotions and, and offers and advertisements that come at you every from every direction. Think about this. In the 1970s, people were exposed to about 500 ads per day. Right now, we're seeing an average of 4,000 to 10,000 a day. That's a huge difference. It's just ads, 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 like lur, 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 throwing right at you. It's actually overwhelming. And even now, everybody is, there's AI is coming on the scene and 35% of businesses have adapted it and they're continuing to use it. So now we're going to have AI overwhelm on everything. And Harvard Health found that our lives have changed significantly since the pandemic, and that really what people crave are stories more than ever. So we went from this old-timey way of just giving ads and throwing it out with facts and forgetting about the story, where now it's evolved and now people crave stories in their advertising. 
Um, you know, you know yourself when you uh, you scroll through your phone. I look at my phone for a news feed, and there's always if I'm on a social media platform, there is an ad somewhere all of the time. And if you look at one ad, you're going to get ten or twenty more just like it. You can't like get away from it. But then you start to wonder, like, how many do you actually remember of all of these four to ten thousand ads? How many do you actually remember? The answer is very few. But you would recall is if someone told you a good story. And that's why we put this together, this narrative nexus, because what I have found through the years of working with writers is that the problem is most people don't know how to tell a good story. So I created, I knew about the narrative nexus. I know that we needed the, those three things, but how could we put that in a framework that would make it easy for someone to learn how to write a story? And for me, it kind of evolved because I like I write stories all the time. And it's like you do it naturally sometimes and you don't even you sit and you're like, well, how did someone ask you, how do you do that? And you're like, oh, I don't know. I just do it. And so when I sat down and really started thinking, I'm like, I actually do have a framework that I use for telling a good story. That's what I can wrap around the narrative nexus and create a way, a structure that would help anybody learn how to write a really good story. So I call it the core story framework because it's basically the framework that I use whenever I'm writing a story. And if I follow this structure, I know from start to finish, by the time I'm done, I have put to together a compelling story that I can use for a client's uh, for my own, whatever I'm trying to do with my own business, I know that these stories are going to work because I followed this structure. I've seen the numbers attached to it. I know that it brings in sales. I know that it gets open rates. I know that it gets clicks. So putting this core story framework together and immersing it in with the narrative nexus is a great way now for anyone to take and figure out, hey, this is what I can use to learn how to write. I know without a doubt now I can write a really strong, compelling story. So again, it's just a way that takes that narrative nexus, which is the experience, right? The emotion and expression. And then how do you put that in a structure that, that makes a compelling story? My framework is 12 points. So I go through one, two, three, four, five, all the way down through 12. I know if I've covered this, these 12 points to follow this framework, by the time I'm done, I'm going to have a really good, compelling story on my hand. And basically what the framework does, besides showing you how to start, where to start, how to end your story, what to do in the middle, it basically it allows you to find stories anywhere and everywhere. And I'm telling you, I don't care what, how boring a topic something can be, you can turn it into a story. And I actually did this a little bit ago um, with a number two pencil when I was talking to AWI staff. I'm like, I can tell you, you can turn, it sounds boring, but I can tell you how to turn a story, anything into a story. And I wrote a story about a number two pencil. This and was actually crazy, guys. Like we, I've been bragging about Sandy and I was telling her to the team. I'm like, this is why I love Sandy. Her stories are so amazing. And I and there's lots of different formats. I see some of you talking about the hero's journey. We'll talk about that. That is a format of selling, of storytelling. But I'm like, Sandy can just tell a story from anything and make anything sound super interesting. And one of our writers like, can you tell a story about a number two pencil? Like trying to be <laughs> peaky. And she did. <laughs> like it was wild. Sorry, go back. No. No, that's the power of this. And so it does. It's like you, it just changes. It's like resets your mind to how you look at stuff like you have a new lens now so anytime you see anything you could be like oh that could be turned into the story even the smallest little factoid can be blown up to a huge compelling story uh, and then it allows you to write those stories in a way that really gets the reader's attention or if you're telling it to listen in because you've got this narrative nexus which is the, the mix of those three things plus you're following the structure and it really just elevates the story to a whole new level. It's a, just a completely different way of approaching how to write a story than anything that's out there. I know that there are other ways, a different methods for telling the story, 
But this method is the one that really works for what we are as writers when we're trying to work with clients. This is the one that really changes everything. Once you show and share with a, a client with a story that you've created, it just makes all the difference in the world. And it lets you find clients that because you have this ability now, you become this super storyteller. That's when clients want to hire you and work with you because you have the thing that's needed the most right now. And so these two people, Robert McGee, he's a scholar about a screenplay, right? And he's really sought after. And Tom Garris, he's a founder of this company called Skyward. The two of them got together and they started working with different companies, helping them boost their sales. And what they realized was these companies lacked storytelling. They weren't telling enough stories. And they actually created this whole thing called story storynomics, basically saying, if you want to increase your sales, you got to go back and start relying on having good stories. You've got to figure out how to create stories in your messaging. Um, and so what they're telling us they are telling these clients they're working for, you need stories. We're past all of this stuff. Consumers don't want the traditional advertising messages. What they crave is a good story. And that's why they're telling their clients, start getting people who know how to tell a good story and work with them. And that's where we are here now. That's It's needed. So if you can learn this core story framework, you become in demand because that's what client, that's what businesses want right now is people who can tell stories. We're, they're, we're moving away from traditional advertising into more of a storytelling environment. I like to think of it as like, like having a you know boxing, a one-two combo, because you've got this narrative nexus and a core framework that helps you elevate everything you write when you're telling a story so that you can you can just knock promotions out of the park. And as we said before, if your client has a promotion that isn't working, you come in and you fix it because you see that it's lacking a good story. Maybe it has a story, but the story is not told in the right way. It doesn't have those mix of emotions. If you come in and fix it and all of a sudden, Things happen. Their sales go up. Uh, you're you're able to write copy that with, that increases their conversions by thirty percent. That's the power of what this does. It's a way for your clients to make more money, but for you to make more money because you're raising their sales because you're coming in and you're saying, "Oh, I'm going to fix this," or "I'll create." If they don't have a story, create it. You can. I'll show you how you can actually create stories out of scratch, out of, like we said, the number two pencil. A client might not think they have a story to tell. They do have a story to tell. They just aren't looking at it through the lens of the core story framework. You are, and you can find their story and pull it out. This is just an example of how powerful it is. Let's say that um, you have a million dollars in sales and you get a 3% royalty rate. That's $30,000. But if you use this core story framework that contains the narrative nexus, it ups that by 30%. Now you're talking 1.3 million at that same royalty rate, 3%. That's $39,000. So you actually made $9,000 more because you were using the narrative nexus in the core story framework. You And you, it really on your part wasn't that hard because once you learn this, it's easy to learn. You'll be able to do this. It's repeatable. You can do this over and over again. And if your client isn't one that does royalties, because not everybody will do, you could ask for a bonus. If what you write exceeds their expectations in a big way, you can get a bonus. So again, more money for you just by knowing how to put the story together. So it's really you can use this core story framework and the narrative nexus for anything, not just sales copy con content as well. Basically anything that can be written can be infused with the core story framework and the narrative nexus. It can boost engagement and post, increase their shares of social media, improve clicks and conversion. I told you that earlier. I've seen the numbers myself with my stuff, sales attached to when I tell stories go up. So do the clicks, the open rates, engagement rate, 
They retain more sales or if they do that, they're adding more profit to the bottom line, which is what every company wants is to increase their profits. It's it's so powerful. Basically, you can use it on anything, anything that your client uses now to talk to their audience, to get attention. You can use the narrative nexus in the core story framework. And you can use it to find clients. I did. <laughs> I use that same core story framework. I use it. It's the thing that I do right now over and over. And I used it in my LinkedIn bio. And when I started doing that, I grew my following by 68%. So huge spike in people who follow me. And I don't even put that many posts out. I used to do it regularly. And I don't even do that much right now. But I still every day get people who are requesting who want to follow me. And my network has exploded to all kinds of people. I mean, I have a, I have a venture capitalist who's part of my network. I actually was on his podcast talking about uh, storytelling and copywriting. I'm a friends with the CEO of an online gaming company. I would have never met these people in real life, but I did attract their attention because I was writing stories and posting it, and then especially in my LinkedIn, and people were noticing. Um, and I actually landed clients this way. I, there was a person who is setting up an online clothing store on Shopify and needed help with writing descriptions of the clothing, but also they wanted just content for the website, including like about them, the founder's page, the headlines for their the front page of their store. They came to me because they saw the stories that I were right, I was putting out. They came to me. I didn't have to track them down. They came to me. So this is a way you can attract clients by showing them and sharing these stories. And if you do it, other things can happen. One of, for me, one of the, because I've been writing stories for years and using this core story framework, for me, one of my bucket list writing projects is I want to write someone's memoirs. To me, that would be like the ultimate thing. So, you know, I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? So I thought, well, I'm going to share the stories that I've been writing. I have my own newsletter that I publish them in. And I'm going to share it with this head of this major ghostwriting agency in New York. And I thought, oh, I gotta, what do I have to lose, right? I'm going to send the email, show them a couple of stories that I think would be appropriate that would match like writing someone's memoirs. And he contacted me like two days later. And he put me in his network of writers. So I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And this, his, the people that come to him that want their memoirs written are like doctors and lawyers and CEOs and founders of company. They aren't writers. They want someone to write their story. And the projects pay like 10,000 up to 50,000. I saw one the other day for 60,000. To, it's to write their memoir. And sometimes it's just, they want people to coach them on how to put a manuscript together. So for me, this was ding, ding, my moment of realization. My bucket list now is one step closer to becoming true of being able to write someone's memoir, all because I shared stories with this person. And the stories that I write, again, are all designed around that core framework that I use, a 12 structure, and it worked. So for me, this thing works. It's landing me clients. It's getting me a step closer to what I really want to do is to write a memoir. So if you're ready to learn it, if you want to take the superpower, if you want to learn how to put this core story framework to work, you can do it. I've got a program put together. I want to share it. I want to teach you what I've been doing uh, all these years, how to properly put a story together that really keeps someone glued to the page and you where you control their whole decision, their whole decision-making from start to finish. Um, and that to me, like that's the ultimate thing as a writer, whether it's content or sales copy, if you can do that, if you can get a reader to do what you want them to do, and just because you're using the power of a framework and a narrative nexus, that is gold. That's what makes you in demand. That's what's going to increase your fees. That's how people are going to want to come and work with you you do it once or twice, you get known, people start talking. She, he is the storyteller that I want. And as I showed you, this is where we're moving to. This is where we're moving to in today's environment. It's all about storytelling. That's what consumers want right now. 
So they, we need people, we need writers who can step up to the plate and say, yes, I am that storyteller. And if you want to get more information, if you want to know it, you can go to www.awai.com, writing superpower, because it is a superpower. I'm telling you, it is, once you learn how to do this, you transform your entire life. I can tell you even personal stories of how using this framework has transformed my life in personal ways. It's that powerful. So any questions, any other thoughts you want to add here, Rebecca? I want to talk first, just first of all, thank you, Sandy. Again, I am so excited for this training, but just even bringing forward this, this thing, because I think it sounds obvious, like, oh yeah, we incorporate stories, but understanding story and the power that it brings, I've been studying this for the last couple of years, and maybe that's why it's so front of mind. I'm obsessed with the brain, but and if you go to this this link, you'll see Sandy's done this research on the power of the brain. But I've you know I've learned over the years that over the last couple of years that our brain's job is really to keep us alive, and so <laughs> it shuts down whenever some. Hopefully, your brain isn't shutting down right now. Whenever something <laughs> is boring or your brain identifies it as not needed to survive, it kind of spaces out. Like, have you ever been in a meeting, been in a webinar, been in the car, whatever, and you just start, you know, your brain is kind of off and you're daydreaming. That's your brain going into like a resting position because it doesn't need to process right now. It's trying not to process to conserve calories in case you get attacked by a bear later on. <laughs> Stories though, are the only time that the brain cannot go into this power down safe mode. It has to lean in for some reason. When someone tells a story, and I might be explaining this improperly, but I am obsessed with this, and this is why the science behind it is there. When someone tells a story, our brain fires up and pulls in because it has to, it thinks that it has to remember all the detail. It has to be able to recall everything. So there's not only the emotional connection that a story brings, but the psychological fact is the person is now paying attention. So imagine how important this is in your writing right? In anything that you're doing. And yes, direct response is huge. If you can go in and write a sales letter that improves response rate by 30%, that's massive. I mean, that's that the potential there is huge. You could go in and write someone else's promo. Like we've got promos that don't have stories attached to them that you could just go in and say, Hey, I got a great, once you learn this kind of framework, you'll learn how to build these stories out, how to research them and how to do it. And then you can go to a client and say, I had a great story. This promo would perform so much better. You could back up the science. You could take our science and use it with clients and say, I think this, and this is, I, I love this technique, not saying, Hey, I think I could do better, or this is how you're falling down. But like, I love this letter. I love this product. But if you incorporate it, I have a great idea for a story that I think would blow the doors off response rates. Do you want to hear it? Who's going to say no? right? It's such a nice way in, but there is psychology behind it. So you want to understand that's part of what this training is, is to understand it's not just about telling any story. There has to be a reason for it. And it has to be good enough to get the brain to fire and, and tune in like that. Because once it does, we recall it, we remember it, we connect with it. And then we tie, to, we share it, we talk about it. How many of you guys, we're talking about books here in the, in the Q&A. How many of you guys have read a story in a great book and then you find yourself telling your neighbor, your spouse at dinner, your kids? Like when I hear a good story, I repeat it six and seven times. And so it's the similar, it's, just, it's because we recall it. Our brain just like grabs onto it and pulls it again and again and again. And when you think about marketing efforts and copy, how great is that? They're telling a story again and again and again in their mind and sharing it that is just reinforcing what you're trying to accomplish, the product, the promise, the action you want them to take, the idea, the, the mindset shift, whatever piece of the journey that you're writing in, the story can be so powerful. And so Sandy, for that, for one of the things, um, and you did touch on this a little bit, it's not just direct response then, right? It can work in attention getting early on. It can work Absolutely. in building connections and relationships. Can you talk a little bit just about that it's not just direct response? No, it's not. It's, it's storytelling. This particular type of storytelling can be used in anything that can be written in any kind of communication. So it isn't just direct response. 
You can do it for content. You can write articles. But if you inject that article for your client with the power of a well-told story, it just is going to raise the bar all the way around. If you have a client who does emails, telling a story in an email, all of a sudden, it's going to raise it. How about newsletters? Tell a good story in a newsletter. These are, It's just so wide-ranging. I said, remember the client that I landed wanted to do a Shopify, selling clothing on Shopify. Who would think that that would be necessary? I went in and said, let me tell some stories. <laughs> and they were like, oh my God, it completely made the difference. So I'm telling the stories about the people who created the site, the founders, what their belief is. Uh, and instead of little descriptions of the clothing, oh, you know, it has buttons down here. I have made little tiny stories. They were blown away. Like that's how you can use it in so many ways. But it's really just knowing how to find and tell that story. And that's what I go through in this pro this whole training is teaching you how to find, because most people feel like I don't have a story. Like those clients thought they had nothing. I made something for them because I understand where a where a story is and how to pull it out and how to make it really compelling. I mean, the woman read it and sent read it back and sent me a message and said, "This is beautiful, Sandy." I hadn't. I met the one two. There's two women who started it. I had a 30 minute conversation on the phone with them and was able to write their story. And they're like, "I didn't even know that we had the story behind us in this particular way." So it can be done for anything. So question here from Gear. Uh, actually, this one first. How about story length from Mike? Can you tell a short story in an email series, say a series of seven short stories to sell a product? So how might that work where you're breaking up a story? You can do that. And if you follow this framework, and this is the cool part, is this framework, there are certain parts in here where this kind of series of emails will fit well because there's a point you're going to go through um, where you, I call it, it's sort of like a zigzag for me when I'm writing a story, it's a zigzag. So I'm in the way that I zigzag is so that I can keep the reader glued to the page because I'm telling, it's like tease a little bit, tease a little bit, tease a little bit, tease a little bit until I ultimately give the reveal. So something for me, when I hear the series that would fit well, because it's like every series that you write could be the cliffhanger to the next one that's coming up and the next one and the next one until you get to whatever it is you're, whether you're selling or getting them, that would keep someone wanting to keep opening those emails by just doing that zigzag. And that's what I go through. And I show you, this is how I create a story that follows this. I need this kind of crazy zigzag pattern, but really what it's doing is just making the reader want to hang on for, for the next thing. So this is, I want you, I'm pulling out of this conversation for one second. I want you guys, I hope you all have, you know, paper and pen, like Sandy's been talking about the story piece of it, but I don't know if you're realizing she's giving so many client getting techniques at the same exact time. And, and Mike, thank you for bringing that up because that's another one. We think about the business of copywriting, how to talk to clients, how to get in with clients. Everybody wants this like magic button. This is such a more authentic way to talk to clients, get in with clients and increase your fees. Like Mike, you just, I, I put yours on the list. The idea of breaking up a story into a series of emails. I could have just written the client an email, one email with a story, in it, or I could suggest, Hey, you know, it's a better idea. Let's keep them going for the whole week and tell the story and have it unfold and increase engagement. Yes. It's going to cost you more client, but you're going to have tons more results at the end of this instead of just one email. Absolutely. That's huge. Huge. Absolutely. And this is I perfect love for it. So we have, I mean, guys, we already have three different ways. We're selling the storytelling idea to our clients. So being able to talk about storytelling from this level, not just, you know, um, hey, if we incorporate stories, but really helping them understand the power of the story. So I hope from what Sandy's talked about today, you kind of have some of those talking points, uh, being able to add stories to what they're already doing. So then saying, for example, I see over on YouTube, you're doing this. I see over in your emails, you're doing this in your newsletter. And Garrett, I'm going to come to your question next. Um, I see what you're doing. I have ideas. Now you've got a way in. And then finally, this breaking up stories into pieces. Mike, mm -hmm. is, I, I double started on my paper because I think that that's a really great, uh, exciting one just because I'm doing the work anyways. Why not break it into pieces and get more from the project? I mean, you could you could literally also to in like in an auditing type of way, you could look at someone's a client's website and see, do they have stories in there? 
do you know maybe they don't or maybe they have some but they're not really getting any kind of uh views because they're not telling the story in the right way so you could approach a client like that you know look i was looking over your website and i love what you have but i didn't see the story of this or that and you know that would be like they could be oh i didn't think of it that way so they are i mean it's it, you can use it in so many ways to get clients love that so much okay so then question sorry i'm typing at the same time garrett says um, my client likes her news. So he uses uh, stories in his client's newsletters, but his client likes her newsletters short, which leaves me feeling stifled. How do you approach this idea to help clients understand that longer copy can be more effective? How do you, how would Garrett broach that conversation with his client? I think maybe a way to do that is to sort of, you know, have a story that she likes and then ask if she'd be willing and open to doing a longer form story and let's just see what the what the audience likes best because sometimes clients do that business owners are get stuck and feel like you know we've been doing it this way forever this is what I like I don't want it but what if like like um uh, save the children the example I showed you right they were losing donors they couldn't figure out why so they went and they did that split test and said one had just listing of information one was a story and when they tested it, the story did better. So what if you were able to convince your client, listen, let's just try this. Let's just see if the longer story might be more engaging than a short story, because maybe the short story is missing some key elements that I can really pull apart and really hone in on the long story. Just see if she'd be willing to do that, because let the results speak for themselves. Um, and it could also be maybe the short story that you're writing if you maybe that just needs a little bit of uh maybe it doesn't have the things that we talked about the experience the expression the emotion maybe it just needs to be infused with that so i think there are different ways you could approach it to see if you could strengthen the short story but also if she'd be willing to let's just see which one works best i mean that's how clients that's how companies grow when they do something different when they test something new and see the results if it increases by 30%, that person's going to want more long stories than short stories. Sometimes the proof is right there in the pudding. Is that the expression? The proof is in the pudding. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so James is asking, you know, he's saying, give us an example of creating a story from nothing. But I think that indicates that we're not quite understanding the purpose of the story. So I want to start with that. There has to be an intention. And then Sandy, I want you to kind of talk a little bit about how you you know, what is a little bit of like, what kind of story, but I'm guessing there has to be an intention, right? Even if I'm not selling a product, I have to know what I'm trying to either convince the reader of the mindset I want them in or the action I want them to take or the product I want to buy. It's not about creating a story from nothing because you do have to have a reason. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you do have a reason. I mean, your, your, your client wants the reader to take some kind of action, whether that's to sign up to get more information or to make a purchase, whatever it is. So you do have to keep that in mind when you're doing this. And pulling it out of nothing is basically what we're saying is you're taking all the things that the client has at their disposal, and that's what you're using. You're going to to write a story requires doing some research. So you're going to have to do a little bit of research to find the golden nuggets, the fascinations that you can use to build the story for that particular piece and what the intent is. So that's what I mean when I say taking it, building it from nothing is nothing really what we're saying is we're just using the research. So when I do it, it's like I call it a tree branch effective research. So I, when I'm researching, I might have 10 tabs open on my computer because ultimately one thing, I'm looking for one thing and I'll find it, but then I'll find something else within that one thing, which means I'm going to open a tab and get more information on that. And again, the same thing will happen. And I'll keep doing this because I'm trying to get as many details as I possibly can, because then I'm going to turn around and construct a story using them. So it's for me, it's just all of these details that I find that I put together. And then from there, I create this fascinating, this compelling story. Um, so here's just a quick off the top of my head, a story that I did. Uh, about two friends who 
created a $6 billion franchise that started out as a joke. They just got together one day and they were like, you know, kind of bored. And they're like, both of them were like artists. And so one said, I'm going to just, let's just sketch. So as a joke to his friend, he sketched a couple turtles. And the guy's like, you think that's good? I can one up you. Here's my turtles. So they're drawing these turtles and they're like, okay, this is funny. Ha ha. Then they're like, well, I'm going to name the turtles. So they gave the turtles names. And they called their turtles the Teenage Newton Ninja Turtles. Shut up. That's funny. <laughs> and then they're like, hey, what? And, and then they're like, let's give each one of the turtles a name. And they're looking through and around. They're like, I don't know. Maybe it could be Joe, James. I don't know. That sounds boring. And while they're sketching and drawing, they had a book of Renaissance art open. And they're like, oh, why don't I just call them like, uh, you know, from the classic artist? And that's how each turtle got its name Leonardo all those so they're like hey this is kind of cool not we're not laughing anymore we think we have something kind of neat here so they both loved comic books and they said wonder if we could take this thing and turn it into a comic book so they borrowed money from their friends and they printed 1500 copies of this story of these neat um, teenage Newton I can't even say it Newton Ninja Turtles and they said, "Just we'll just see what happens. And all 1,500 copies were bought out. And then they're like, oh, my God, we're on to something. So then they had to create more and more and more. And the next thing you know, it grew into a franchise. There were toys, movies. It turned out to be $6 billion worth of, ha-ha, just for fun, we're going to sketch and see if we can out-sketch each other. That's the story of that of the, of how that came about. I wrote that story and I just started, once I found one little thing, I wanted to know another little thing. How did they hook up with the toy manufacturing company? How did they hook up with the movie company to make the movie? You know, all of these little details all of a sudden come together to create this story that's like, like you just did when you hear that story, but it's like, oh, I did not know that. That is a story out of, I would say again, creating it from scratch, but really creating it from details. That is so much. Um, my kids are obsessed with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I just love this, the backstories of how things like that come to be. And you can make random connections, right? Like the stories oftentimes aren't these literal, like I'm trying to find a story that supports turtles. It could be something from something. One of the things I've always admired about you too, is just your, your level of consumption of content. Sandy is a huge reader and I remember uh, copywriter John Ford in a class telling me once about big idea. He was saying, I can't tell you really like how to get it, but I can tell you that the more you put in, the likelihood of a good idea coming out increases the more you put it. And so I'm guessing there's the research side of it, but there's also just this when you're researching for one story, you're finding 50 other potential stories that are coming absolutely, in. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So then you just have this whole like... Uh, I don't know, a toolkit, an arsenal of all these different bits of knowledge that you can use that you can create stories that you, you, you'll be so knowledgeable. Just imagine me and I will talk to a client, you know, when, what if you tell a story like the, the teenage on uh, Newton Minda turtles, I can't even. I'm going to make you say it at boot camp from the stage. <laughs> it's going to be like one of our gag inside. You got to say it. You say it? No. <laughs> I um, dare you. <laughs> But, you know, you could that could be a conversation starter with a client. Just yeah. Story of, you know, and then the, most people will be like, no. And you tell the story and you're in and you could start talking to a client and you could and then you could say, you might have a story similar. Can I just do a little bit of research and see what kind of story I can come up with? People love business origin stories. They love those backstories and they're not told often enough, but apply that for your client, for their product. Um that would be tremendous to have that, be able to pull those stories out. Love that. I love this too. Swiss is in the chat. Tree branch research. I like that term. Um, thanks, Andy. Many days I have five or 10 tabs open because I clicked one link on the page and that led to another. But what I wanted to just hone in on is this idea of phrasing. That's another great thing that Sandy does. And you guys should always be thinking this way. 
of having a methodology that you use in your writing. When she says something like my tree branch research, imagine talking to a potential client and making that part of that methodology. Well, I start with my tree branch research to find the ideal story that, so really when you're listening to Pete, to masters, like Sadie, they think of it as just, you know, it's just their process. They've identified it, but think about how you can use those things in your own ways of talking to clients from a confidence standpoint. It gives both of you confidence. It gives you confidence that you have a process and it gives the client confidence that you are way higher in pay grade because anyone who has a process it assumes is very experienced, right? A process implies experience. Otherwise a process wouldn't exist. Right. So anytime you develop a process, name a process, write about a process, identify it, refer to it on your website, in your LinkedIn materials, all that stuff. It's such a great marketing tool because I don't even have to know how much experience you have. I don't have to know about your clients. I don't even need to see your samples. When I see that you have a process for how you go about things, I immediately assume, well, she's been, that's a lot of experience then, right? <laughs> the brain just says. It's, exactly. So I want to point out Swiss's comment because again, as you guys are attending these webinars and these training sessions like this, there's so much gold like within the gold <laughs> of things like that. So thank you, Sandy, for that. Felicia wants to know, how do you use storytelling for a B2B high cost product? I know this is kind of taking it out of left field, but what would you do for something like, there's two pieces to this. So one storytelling for a high cost product in the B2B cycle, it's more about um, getting attention and getting somebody in. So I'm guessing case study form type of story, but I want to ask you that question. But first, while you're thinking about that, I'll answer the second question. Customers have a very limited time and can't read a long email like the ADY emails that promote courses. So two things I want to talk about there. One, B2B in general is different. B2B people read very long content. They read, they sit through hours of long presentations. They read through 10 pages of white paper, stuff like they actually consume 22 forms of content broken into little pieces before they make a buying decision. Long versus short, and I've seen comments about this. We just don't, you never know. We don't know someone's attention. When you say someone doesn't have the time to read something, the only time I don't have the time to read something is if it's boring, exactly. right? If you think about it, we don't flip the channel on the TV because the TV show is exciting. We flip it because it's boring. We put the book down because it's boring, because our brain stop, unless also my kids need something, then I also have to put the book down. But in general, I put it down because I'm bored. So we have to think about that. Don't assume that short copy will always outperform. In our experience, it rarely outperforms long copy. We focus more on writing better copy that keeps people engaged because the longer someone invests in your copy, the more likely they are to move forward. Now, that's not just the case for long sales letters. It's not just about keeping someone's attention and time on page. Short form copy only serves the people who are ready to respond at that point. Long form copy appeals to short form readers who know that they can just jump to the end and also appeals to people who are not ready yet. Trying to determine when someone is ready in a sales letter, is it page two, page 12? page 20, for the person who has decided they jump ahead, the person who reads through to page 23, 27, 33, has not been satisfied yet. So by cutting the copy short and only appealing to the people who are ready to buy on page three, let's say, what happens? I lose everybody else who also needed more time to make to, to, to fully make a decision. So there's a lot of conversation loops that are opening here, but I wanted to address that just because I don't want anyone walking away with an assumption that people don't have time to read something. That is not the case. And that oftentimes long form does work better simply because you have a bigger, more time, yeah. investment of time. And, and yes. to make your argument, exactly. It's what you said. You click away from things that are boring. Things that you find interesting, you're going to keep reading. And stories... Number one, we're hardwired for stories. Our brains, uh, Princeton study did some uh, research and they actually scanned brains as people were reading things. And the brain was lighting, lighting up when they were reading stories. So stories naturally give you that little bit of edge, just working in the brain and knowing how it works. You get that edge if you tell a story. If it's a good story, it's no one's clicking away because they're compelled to want to read and continue to the end. So that's the difference. It's like we 
we ourselves sometimes mistakenly think it has to be short in this age of what we're dealing with when I talked about being bombarded with messages. But what we're finding is we're turning the corner now. We are craving stories. We want stories. We want a well-told story. It can be long form, but a good story also can be a few pages. As long as you've got that framework you're following that hits those certain points that you know compel readers to want to know more. So interesting. So then going to that B2B high cost, how might you incorporate stories into a I, you know, long, long-term long sale? One of the one of the statistics I showed is that B2B marketers say, 62% say that storytelling works best as one of their content forms. And so I think what I would talk with the client and for that high uh, price thing is I usually have uh, like five questions that I start to ask, like who, what, when, where, why, how. And those somehow will start to give me details that I can then use to create the story. So if I applied it there, I would start to then get some details about that high price thing, how it was manufactured, when it was manufactured, why was it manufactured, who did it, who's using it, why are they using it, how are they using it? Those kind of things and then would start to give me ingredients I can use to write a story to help sell it or share that information with the B2B client. So that's how I would start it. But case studies, white papers are just, as you were saying, there's 22 things that B2B marketers use. Those two, the case studies and white, white papers, but especially case studies allow you to tell the story. But if you dig in that way, if you start asking those questions and keep getting the details, you'll have enough information to put together a compelling story. Perfect. It's funny, Ruth, I'm answering Ruthie here, but she said, you know, people's attention span shorter these days, isn't it better to cut it to short and sweet? And just to put a period on this, their attention span is not shorter. The number of distractions is higher which requires better writing. We have to be relevant, we have to be engaging and we have to work harder and better as writers. But that's how we, that's the way anybody teaches, the way with Sandy, with things like storytelling, that is how you help your clients rise above the noise and keep people's attention. Got lots of just great uh, comments. Like Garrett's gonna use this with his client. Um, Mike thinks this is so much clarity in this topic and this is a wonderful new option for connecting to clients and customers. So lots of just great feedback. So that's exciting. I hope to see you guys in the training. Um, I was typing an answer to that one. Sandy, have you ever been tasked with just doing an illustration? An illustration? Like, yeah, a- like a visual instead of, uh, a, I, don't, I don't, can't imagine that you have. No. <laughs> He's a writer. <laughs> I, I mean, I... No, I haven't done an illustration. In fact, yeah, I am a writer. I, um, I think if I dabbled in an illustration, um, <laughs> it probably wouldn't get anybody's attention. Although my dad was a painter and my brother and sister seem to have inherited that gene from him. But I, I, I don't. I'm strictly writing. My specialty is storytelling. That's what I do best. That's what I have come to realize after all these years. The thing that I do best above anything else is tell a story, a well-told story, especially give me pen and pencil and I will tell a really good story or a computer, I'll tell a good story. That's something that I just love and I feel like it's it's just not, not taught enough. We don't learn it enough. You know, we assume we know it, um, but there's an art to telling a story. There's a skill to it. And that's what I'm trying to um, share in this training program is to help you construct a really well-told story. And it, and if and if you take the program with me, I mean, it, I'm, it's going to be live. So I'm going to break down every session. But the other thing is, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a story. I'm going to give you a subject matter and you're going to write a story. And then when you're done, you're going to turn it in. I'm going to give you feedback. So I'll be able to go through and say, hey, this part was good or this part needs improvement. So you'll come out of here with an actual story that you can use um, to share with clients, put it in your portfolio or whatever you want. But I'm going to make sure that you understand how to use this this core story framework. Ah, I'm typing. Um, (laughs) See, won't read a message that doesn't apply to the reader. Those who won't read a longer message probably aren't interested. Must evoke that's for me. That is right, Michael. It's all about getting somebody's attention. Another great uh, copywriting uh, important tactic. All right, I'm going to do a last call.
call for questions. And Muriel, I am answering your question. Just taking me a few seconds to type. Are there any more questions for Sandy about storytelling or anything else for that matter? Going once, <laughs> going twice. <laughs> Sandy, I'm going to give you the last word as far as just kind of next steps. We know about the training, but in general, is there anything else that you would give to writers about improving with the use of story or any other last words? Yeah, you know, as I said before, it's to me, what I what I have noticed is the more that I have concentrated on writing stories, my writing level has gotten much better. And the other thing I've noticed, too, is that my ability, now I can't pronounce the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles properly, yeah. <laughs> but I sure as heck can find a good story and do it quickly. I, I can immediately, it's like I, I put my special storytelling glasses on these. These actually just help me see better, but I can see things now when I see anything of all the stuff I consume, I can find, I immediately will find something like I know instantly I can use that to tell a good story. And that's what, if you start doing this too, you're going to just see everything differently. You're going to see it from the world of storytelling and you're just going to be a great, better writer all the way around. It really does up your writing skill when you could tell a really good story because it, it really does make you it's the time in your life where you can be in control of where you want your reader to go and do because uh, you've got them hooked onto this really great story like you're controlling their emotions in a good way and I'm not making this being manipulative but you're doing it in a good way because you're giving them great information but you're telling it in a in a story a compelling story way so to me, and just because of the research I've done, where I see that this trend now is moving toward stories, and that's what people crave, I think this is like the right time to, to, to get in and know how to tell a story and help your clients. You can open their eyes, too. They don't know the power of a story, but you do. Okay, some really, I just want to close out some of these. Rochelle says, thanks for this. This makes it way more fun and refreshes my inspiration. So awesome, okay. Rochelle. I, I love that. And my advice is when you start to feel re-inspired, when you start to feel ambition, get up and move. Literally get out of your chair right now and move around the room. I love the brain. And it solidifies right now to your brain that you are on something big. So whatever your plan is for your writing, do something right now about it. Physically get up right now. And then go do something because again, you want whenever you have natural ambition, you want to latch onto it and do something with it. Uh, Michael is asking, is there an offer for Circle of Success members? Yes, there is. It should be on your member page, but definitely um, there is a discount for Circle of Success and our Infinity members. Rebecca is asking how many classes and on what days. Uh, this is a longer training. And Sandy, I'd love for you to talk about that for a second. This is not like we're not just like learning to write emails and then moving out our way. This is like flexing the muscle and getting stronger. The end game for this is not to just, it sounds simple, right? I'm gonna learn how to tell a story. It's not that. It is way bigger than this. Yeah. And you are going to really work this muscle so that when you leave this training, you are powerful like Sandy. So tell us Sandy, yeah. really quickly, just kind of why it's 12 weeks and how we're building it out that way. Yeah, I it's I did it on purpose. I didn't want it to be a short program because to me you can't learn the skill of the core framework and the narrow nexus and being a really good storyteller. You can't do it in two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks. You actually need the time to do it because I'm breaking down each step. There are different elements. Remember I said, I do like a zigzag as I tell a story. Each one of those elements, I'm breaking it down so that you understand it so that you know, okay, this, I got this part of it. Then we move to the next part. So that's why I broke it down into 12 sessions or 12 because each time I'm going through the steps so this is the like the we're going to learn I'll tell you more about like why story is important in one of the sessions but in one session like I'm going to tell you like when you start a story the first sentence or two those are the most important things and I'm going to show you how to construct that construct that sentence because once you write it like that then people continue to read so we're going to go through how do you do that I'm going to show you how to do that there's all those little secrets through the throughout the program that I'm sharing of this is what I use to tell a story that I know someone will want to read and I know because I said I on the side I have a hobby newsletter and I write stories and I constantly get like 46 50 percent open rates and all I'm telling are sometimes stories of 
like I told the story of um, like the ABC supply company. You know, that sounds like, oh, that's so boring. But no, <laughs> if you go through this framework, then you actually find that there's all these details that come out and that people don't know. That's what makes the story compelling. So that's why I broke it down on purpose. I wanted to make sure that we hit every point properly and that you thoroughly understand it. And then, like I said, I'm going to give you a story. You don't have to search for one. I'm going to give you two, two stories you can pick from. You pick which one you want to write, and uh, the training is going to show you how to write the story, and then you'll be able to turn it in the end of training, and I'll give you feedback to say, hey, this was great. This is a great story, or hey, let's just fix this part a little bit more. Um, you know, you didn't zag here when you should have. Uh, that would have been a perfect time to zigzag, and you, and you forgot to zigzag. <laughs> just think this. Stories, a good story never starts at the beginning, ever. Okay, answering last questions. Um, okay, so Caroline, I think I answered your question about where to start the story and uh, Sandy just talked about it there. And I'm gonna answer this question because I get this one a lot. I get this email at least once a day. I never read an entire long form copy article. I don't care how good it is. I'll read the first page, then jump to the end. Then maybe I'll go back to the beginning and the closing. If the closing is compelling, I use stories all the time, but not long form. Is this course still applicable to me? So I want you, yes, telling stories is a framework, but I just want to address that, is this for me? Only you know, because a lot of people have this question, only you know if it's for you. How are you going to use this? Like we always, Sandy and I always talk about why, why me, why this, why now? If you are looking to become a better writer, yes, this is for you. If you're looking to make more money as a writer, yes, this is for you. If you are looking to gain confidence in not just like the tactical of how to write things, but confidence in being a powerful writer, confidence with talking to clients about writing, this course is for you. So whether, no matter what you're in, B2B, I wanna write emails, I'm doing a money-making website, I saw one of those, all those things, it doesn't matter because what Sandy's talking about with her with the core story framework and how she writes, you can ask Sandy to write about anything in any industry at any amount. And she will be able to come up with a uh, an engaging, compelling story that will get someone engaged, paying attention and moving. So that's the short answer to that question. But the whole not reading the long form stuff, if you want to know if it's for you, just always ask yourself, like, why this? What am I going to get from this investment, this time, this, this money? And is this the right time for me? But again, if you're looking to become a better writer, a more powerful writer, a more effective writer, or you've just been lacking confidence, Confidence comes with experience and having this experience with Sandy of working for 12 weeks. I mean, I have worked with Sandy on lots of projects. So much confidence comes from just that time of understanding and coming back and collaborating and getting feedback and doing by the time you work with clients, it's not like you're just applying a skill. It's in you. The experience mm -hmm. is there. And that's a natural confidence. You cannot jump ahead to confidence. Confidence comes with time and experience. And this program will definitely give you great confidence in being a powerful writer. I agree. I, I think it just if you just take it just for the fact you want to become a better writer, that is enough right there. Because storytelling, if you can do that, you're just you're the foundational skill that we all must have. But we don't always have the time. You know, where can you be taught? Really, how do I sit down and tell a story, a really good story, using a proven framework? Well, here it is, and it's going to make you a better writer, period. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing this today and for bringing this together, this program. We are very, very excited about it and uh, looking forward to going through it. So thank you. I'm, I'm excited, too, and I hope that people... If you know, if you take nothing away from here, it's the stories are what people crave today. And so if you don't want this program, that's fine. You should start incorporating stories in your with your clients because that's where things are moving. So, but I enjoyed it and I hope people join me because I love teaching and I especially love teaching this stuff. And maybe, maybe somebody in the group can teach me how to be an illustrator. <laughs> I had to say teenage, teenage yeah, mutant ninja turtles. <laughs> For those of you coming from boot camp, watch. It's a dare that I will put on the stage. I will have her say oh it. Andy and I love to do dares. 
So I challenge extended. Oh my God. I'm going to be practicing for weeks. <laughs> uh, Sandra, people are saying this is coming at the very best time. So that's super exciting. Sandra, you sign up for money making website. Should you do both again? Only you know if it's the right time. Will it benefit? I mean, money making website is about building a business. You're going to need stories for life in any kind of content business. So I, if you can do both, then 100% simply because everything that you learn from Sandy, Nick is going to be the tactical. We're going to build the business, pick an idea, monetize all the things. Then Sandy's going to show you how to write stories that will make your website so much better from everybody, anybody else's that's out there and keep people connected to you, which always then drives your, your profit, your monetization, the ways that Nick is showing you how to make money with your website, your stories will drive more and more people through that. So it will be beneficial. So many great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for this presentation. Thanks, Sandy. This is enlightening. Everybody is loving it. So thank you great. guys for being here. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Sandy, for taking the time and we'll see you again very soon. All right. Sounds good. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone.